Thank you so much, Lloyd. Um, um, I'm Tony Orr. I'm the, one of the co-directors of the Institute and the chair of the Education Committee that, that helped to put on this um, symposium. I wanted to give a shout out to all these amazing set of young um, and, and emerging faculty members in, our, um, in pediatric medicine who've really done an amazing job and point out two things at the end. There's going to be, um, at about 3.30, we're going to uh, leave and go to the poster session. There's also a speed dating session that will happen. Um, please sign up um, in the back. Um, there's 17 faculty members that are the dates. Six, there's six sessions. Um, this is just like the real thing, guys. There's, there's going to be a bell and everything. So get, get excited about it, um, including Dean Miner. Um, so if you, have a, if you have a question or an answer or you want to collaborate with someone, sign up in the back for one of the six sessions for the 17 faculty that are going to be dating. It will be life-changing, I promise. Um, and so now I just wanted to introduce our keynote speaker, Sean Morrison. Um, Sean is the Mary McDermott um, Cook Chair of Pediatric Genetics and the Catherine and Jean Bishop Distinguished Chair in Pediatric Research. Sean is a home, is a, um, was a Canadian, um, but then came to Stanford to work in Irv Weissman's lab as a PhD student. Um, from there, he um, got, uh, again, the amazing training here at Stanford, and then went on to do um, postdoctoral work uh, at Caltech with David Anderson on neural stem cells. And then at his time for 12 years in Michigan, he then rose the ranks and became the, the director of the, the stem cell research facility um, um, in Michigan. He was then recruited to actually head up an institute just very similar to the MCHRI here um, at UT Southwestern. Over the last um, now uh, eight or nine years, really has transformed that pediatric research um, institute into a juggernaut um, of stem cell and cancer therapy, uh, where um, with an amazing set of, of resources uh, um, and life-changing um, transformative research. Um, Sean is a, uh, got a presidential, early presidential career award uh, a merit award from the Aging Institute. Uh, he was recently uh, elected to the National Academy of Medicine last year, um, and really is a, 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 um, we want to claim him as a sta our Stanford own. Um, so please join me in welcoming um, Sean Morrison. Um. Thank you, Tony, for that uh, warm introduction. Uh, having done my graduate work here at Stanford, um, Stanford has long had a place in my heart, uh, and so it's, um, I appreciate the opportunity to come back and visit and see so many old friends and visit old parts of campus that I haven't been in a long time. Um, the scale of Stanford's investment in translational research is remarkable and impressive, and it's such an inspiring community here. The scope of the, the Maternal and Child Health Research Institute um, ambitions with respect to promoting translation is also something that's incredibly impressive. So I've learned a lot since I've been here, and I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this. Um, my laboratory, uh, you're able to hear me OK? My laboratory, oh, I've got a pointer here. We study the intrinsic mechanisms within stem cells that allow stem cells to execute self-renewing divisions. Stem cells in many different tissues have to self-renew to persist throughout life in order to maintain the regenerative capacity of those tissues. We also study the extrinsic mechanisms by which the microenvironment or the niche maintains stem cell function, particularly in the bone marrow. Uh, and we also go back and forth between normal stem cells and cancer cells to compare the self-renewal of normal stem cells to the self-replication of cancer cells. Because cancer cells, cancer is a disease of dysregulated self-renewal, where cancer cells hijack stem cell self-renewal mechanisms to enable neoplastic proliferation. Um, so um, my lab covers a fair amount of ground, but I'm not going to try to give you a broad overview. Rather, I'm going to focus on our studies of the microenvironment in the bone marrow that regulates the maintenance of hematopoietic stem cells. And in fact, hematopoietic stem cells are not the only physiologically important stem cell that's present in the bone marrow. There are also skeletal stem cells that you need to generate the new bone that's required to maintain your skeleton throughout life. So um, the question that we're starting out with is, which cells are maintaining hematopoietic stem cells? And what's the relationship between those cells and the skeletal stem cells that are required to maintain the adult skeleton? Our interest in this area started um, about 15 years ago 
when we discovered the SLAM family markers that are used to purify mouse somatopoietic stem cells. Uh, prior to this time, it had been possible for 30 years, based on work done in Irv Weissman's lab, to, to purify hematopoietic stem cells. But the protocol that we had developed in Irv's lab depended on the use of about a dozen different antibodies and five color flow cytometry. And it was such a complicated set of markers that it was impossible in thinking about where the niche was in hematopoietic tissues, it was impossible to do the simple experiment of cutting sections through hematopoietic tissues just to ask where the stem cells were located. So there were all kinds of proposals about where the stem cells were that were based on um, not very sensitive or specific markers. The SLAM family markers were the first time that we were able to highly purify hematopoietic stem cells with a simple two-color combination uh, of antibodies. And so that made it possible to cut sections through hematopoietic tissues and to see where the stem cells were. And when we did that, we found that most hematopoietic stem cells were immediately adjacent to sinusoidal blood vessels, not just in the bone marrow, also in the spleen. So this white is a um, panendothelial antigen that marks the endothelial cells around a sinusoid. This is the lumen of the sinusoid. This giant yellow, yellow cell is a megakaryocyte. Megakaryocytes are also known to localize to sinusoids. So we, when we saw that most hematopoietic stem cells were adjacent to sinusoids, we proposed in 2005 that there was a perivascular niche for the maintenance of hematopoietic stem cells. Now, I think there was probably nobody who thought we could be right about this when we first proposed it because there was an alternative model that was very popular and widely published in the field, the idea that stem cells were attached to osteoblasts and that osteoblasts secreted the factors required for stem cell maintenance. Um, <clears throat> so, and to be fair, um, the key question, of course, is which cells are secreting the factors that stem cells require in order to be maintained. And we had no data on that. Actually, nobody had ever systematically examined the expression patterns of those factors. And the direct experiment that you'd really like to do to conditionally delete specific factors from specific cell types, no one had ever done that experiment in the hematopoietic system. <laughs> so we decided um, to, to test all of the models in parallel. First, by making GF P and DS-RED knocking alleles of two factors that are known to be important niche factors required for the maintenance of hematopoietic stem cells, stem cell factor and CXCL12. We used those alleles to systematically examine the expression patterns. And then we also made flocked alleles of each of those factors and identified Cree alleles or used Cree alleles that others had identified to conditionally delete each of these factors in every candidate niche cell population that anybody had proposed. In this way, we tested all of the models. So what's the most efficient way to advance these slides? Uh, OK. All right. So this is what it looked like when we knocked GFP into the stem cell factor locus. This is a low magnification section through a femur. So this is bone on the top and bone on the bottom, and this is all bone marrow in the middle. Um, when we osteoblasts live here at the interface of bone and bone marrow, when we look closely at those cells, um, they don't express stem cell factor at all, and they express only a tiny level of CXCL12. Rather, the vast majority of SCF expression is in, present in these little rings throughout the bone marrow some of which are close to bone surfaces, some of which are distant from bone surfaces. So these rings are the sinusoidal blood vessels throughout the bone marrow. So we're seeing the SCF expressed exactly where we saw the stem cells localized. And if you look at high magnification, we see a very low level of stem cell factor expressed in the endothelial cells themselves. The, most, the vast majority of stem cell factor is in perivascular stromal cells that surround the sinusoids. And at the time when we saw this, we didn't know what those cells were. There had been very little characterization of stromal cells in the bone marrow. Um, but we used this GFP marker as a tag to purify the cells, and we did gene expression profiling. And we found that we could purify and identify these perivascular stromal cells based on expression of full-length leptin receptor. Uh, and in fact, nearly all of the cells in the bone marrow uh, 
that make high levels of stem cell factor or CXCL12 are leptin receptor positive. So we can, using these, uh, uh, these uh, reporter alleles, we can do the unbiased experiment of asking what percentage of the cells that express high levels of stem cell factor fall within this leptin receptor positive population. It's 94%. And what percentage of cells that express high levels of CXCL12 fall in this population? It's 90%. So there continues in this literature to be proposals about one cell or another cell that people assert to be niche cells that are major f sources of niche factors, usually without any direct evidence to support the claim. But if you do the unbiased experiment, there's not much room for additional cell types that would be major sources of these factors, at least in normal young adult bone marrow. So we also conditionally deleted these factors in, in every potential niche cell population that anybody had proposed. When we uh, ubiquitously delete these factors, we saw stem cell depletion, as you would predict from 30 years of earlier literature. If we deleted stem cell factor from osteoblasts, there was no effect on stem cells, no effect on hematopoiesis, consistent with the fact that we couldn't see stem cell factor in those cells. There's a very low level of CXCL12 in the osteoblasts, when we deleted it, there was no effect on stem cells, but there was a depletion of a subset of early lymphoid progenitors. So there is an osteoblastic niche. It's just not a niche for stem cells. It's a niche for a subset of early lymphoid progenitors. Um, we don't see any expression of, of these factors among hematopoietic cells in the bone marrow, and when we deleted, um, there was no effect on stem cells. There are some other stromal cell populations that others have suggested are part of the niche, but we're not able to identify uh, stem cell factor or CXCL12 expression in these populations in adult bone marrow. And when we delete these factors, there's no effect on stem cells, no effect on hematopoiesis. The only place where we did see an effect on stem cells was when we deleted in endothelial cells or in leptin receptor positive cells, and now we saw stem cell depletion. So this predicted then that there were two cell types. We're used to thinking there, you know, there's one niche cell and there's a stem cell attached to it. Well, there's two cells that are making uh, key factors that are required for stem cell maintenance. Since this work was all published, other labs have looked at other factors and these cells are also making other factors that the stem cells require. So the, the prediction from this was that if we would delete stem cell factor in both the endothelial cells and the leptin receptor positive cells, we should see a severe depletion of hematopoietic stem cells. And we do. So if we generate the double Cree mice that delete in both cell types, whether we look based on surface markers or whether we look based on function and transplantation assays, we see a severe depletion of hematopoietic stem cells. In fact, from the double Cree mice, um, all quiescent and all serially transplantable uh, stem cells are gone from the bone marrow. So this was what finally proved that there really was, there really is a perivascular niche for the maintenance of hematopoietic stem cells. Now, one of the other factors that's been limiting in this field is um, the rarity of stem cells themselves makes it very difficult to be able to image them. In that original paper in 2005 where we proposed that there was a niche, a perivascular niche, um, Toshio Washita, who was a, a, a pathologist, postdoc, in my laboratory, spent a month in a dark closet looking through a fluorescence microscope at thin sections to count, I think it was a total of 25 or about 25 hematopoietic stem cells, most of which were around sinusoids. Now, after we published that paper, there was a series of other papers from other laboratories making very different claims about where the stem cells were. And one, one could imagine that at least part of the problem is that everybody's looking at small numbers of cells. What you'd really like is to be able to see the whole picture, to not just look in thin sections, but to look at thick segments of bone marrow, and instead of counting dozens of cells, to be able to see hundreds or thousands of cells. So there were a number of technical advances that were required to get there. Uh, Kieran Kocher Lakota, who's here now at Stanford, uh, worked on this project in my laboratory. Um, one of the things uh, that she and others in my lab managed to do was to figure out how to clear bones and bone marrow so that they uh, literally became see-through and we could do high throughput confocal imaging. Actually, we had the craziest argument when we were trying to publish this paper with uh, reviewer number three, who kept pointing at this picture and saying, 
there's no bone marrow in there. And we said, there's bone marrow in there, but we've cleared it so you can't see it. No, 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 there's no bone marrow in there. <laughs> so this is what it looks like if you actually um, image these bones by confocal microscopy uh, and uh, proving that there really is bone marrow in there. Um, and uh, the second advance was the discovery of a new marker for hematopoietic stem cells called alpha catulin. You've probably never heard um, of this gene. It's, uh, it's thought to encode a cytoskeletal linker protein that regulates rho GTPA signaling. We had hoped that this would be a great new regulator of stem cell function, but we knocked it out and there was absolutely no phenotype. And we were highly motivated to find a phenotype. And um, Irv often says that that's when he knows when a gene is really important, when there's no phenotype in the mouse. Um, because so many of the key stem cell markers have no phenotype when you knock them out. So this, um, this made it a, an even better marker, the fact that it was highly restricted in its expression to the stem cells, but that it wasn't required for stem cell function. And so we could image alpha catulin positive CKIT positive cells in the bone marrow and see where they are. So these yellow spheres mark the positions of where, where the stem cells were located in this segment of bone marrow. I should say that the reason, um, I'm not showing you the functional data here, it's all published. All stem cell activity falls within this alpha catulin GFP positive fraction, but alpha catulin positive um, GFP positive cells are less than 0.01% of bone marrow cells. And if we identify these cells based on both GFP expression and expression of the receptor for stem cell factor, CKIT, those cells are about as highly purified for hematopoietic stem cells as using any of the best combinations of markers. 30% of single cells from that population give stem cell activity if we transplant them into irradiated mice. So we've now then, with these approaches, been able to um, generate digital um, three-dimensional images of large segments of bone marrow and um, to illustrate so we can fly through the bone marrow and do close-ups on individual stem cells. So to illustrate that I'm going to show you a video. So um, of course the bony looking stuff is bone and the stuff in the middle is bone marrow. Uh, alpha catulin among hematopoietic cells is highly restricted in its expression to the stem cells but it's also expressed in sinusoidal endothelial cells. So this green blood vessel looking thing is, is the main draining sinusoid throughout, through the bone marrow and we can see it because there are alpha catulin positive endothelial cells that form the wall of the sinusoid. But we can distinguish those endothelial cells from the stem cells because the stem cells also express the stem cell factor receptor CKIT. So in this video, sinusoidal endothelial cells will be green, the stem cells will be green and white, and the leptin receptor positive niche cells will be red. So we're going to fly into this image and we're going to do a close up on a, on a stem cell and I'm stopping it a few times so I can show you where we're going. This cell is likely to be a stem cell because it's positive for both alpha catulin and CKIT and its position is typical for where we see stem cells uh, in the bone marrow as well as in the spleen. This is a, it, they're, not so, they're not so much clustered around the large draining sinusoid, um, but they are clustered around these sinusoids uh, that, that lead into the uh, collecting sinusoid. So remember the genetics told us that the key, the cells that are the key sources of factors required for stem cell maintenance are the red leptin receptor positive cells and these green uh, endothelial cells. And all the stem cells that we see are closely associated with those two cell types. So we can do close-ups on these cells and now the conclusions about where stem cells are located are not based on dozens of cells, they're based on thousands of cells that we can find throughout. We're in the process of um, actually building a lattice light sheet microscope that we can put bone marrow specimens in to do this now with a much greater resolution. Um, and the hope is that we'll be able to get clear subcellular imaging of the synapse between the stem cells and the niche. So um, the conclusion having uh, now imaged very large numbers of stem cells is that there are almost no stem cells that are close to bone surfaces. In fact, they're really depleted close to bone surfaces. Rather, uh, the vast majority of hematopoietic stem cells are around sinusoidal blood vessels. It doesn't matter whether you're looking for 
dividing or non-dividing stem cells. Um, they're mostly um, closely associated with sinusoids. There's another 10% of stem cells that may be more closely associated with arterioles <laughs> and another 10% of stem cells that may be associated with the transition zone vessels between the sinusoids and the arterioles. So um, one of the questions that I always get when I give this talk is um, stem cells are about three out of every 100,000 cells in the bone marrow. Leptin receptor positive cells are about uh, three out of every thousand cells in the bone marrow. And so the frequency of the leptin receptor positive cells is a hundred times greater than the frequency of the hematopoietic stem cells. And so the first question always uh, is, well, if the leptin receptor positive cells are creating a niche for the stem cells, why is the frequency of the leptin receptor positive cells a hundred times greater than the frequency of stem cells? And there's many potential answers for that. But one of the things that we've been thinking about recently is the fact that uh, hematopoietic stem cells are not the only cells in the bone marrow that depend on stem cell factor. There are many restricted hematopoietic progenitors. Here um, is the, the, um, the, the, the hierarchy here. Hematopoietic stem cells are about 0.003%. Leptin receptor positive cells are 0.3%. But all of these lineage negative primitive progenitor populations, many of which were characterized initially in Irv Weissman's lab, um, these are all CKIT positive. And we know that they functionally depend on stem cell factor. So the question is, are they also depending on stem cell factor from endothelial cells and leptin receptor positive cells? Or is there some other distinct cell type that they're getting stem cell factor from? So we've addressed that uh, more recently. And these, um, these uh, bar charts are going to look awfully busy to you. I apologize for that. But they're all the same. And so let me explain. This is um, wild type control, looking at the frequency of hematopoietic stem cells. The way we do these experiments usually is to conditionally delete one allele of SCF in a, a, a mouse that's flox over null. So the mice are heterozygous for a null allele, and then we're only requiring the Cre allele to delete a single flox allele so that we're less subject to imperfect uh, deletion efficiency. So the, this blue bar is the control against which we're going to, the heterozygous control against which we're going to compare the experimental mice. The orange bar is where we've deleted SCF in endothelial cells. The green bar is where we've deleted from the leptin receptor positive cells. And the yellow bar is where we've deleted in both endothelial cells and leptin receptor positive cells. So comparing to the blue bar, um, with hematopoietic stem cells, we see a significant reduction in stem cell frequency when we delete in endothelial cells, and a significant reduction when we delete in uh, leptin receptor positive cells, so that when we delete in both, there's almost no stem cells left. We've already published that, but we've independently confirmed that in another set of experiments. Curiously, however, when we looked at multipotent progenitors immediately downstream of the hematopoietic stem cells, now we don't see any significant effect of deleting in the endothelial cells. We only see an effect of deleting in the leptin receptor positive cells. Now, when we first saw this, we thought, well, it's, maybe it's some weird thing. Maybe we just didn't do enough mice. But look, this is the number of mice. We did a lot of mice. Um, and um, the other interesting thing is there are these two uh, progenitor populations downstream of multipotent progenitors. We think that these are the earliest stages where lineage commitment is occurring. People often refer to these as MPP2, MPP3. But in fact, if you really look at the single cell level in vitro or in vivo, these populations don't look like they're multipotent at the single cell level. Rather, they look like they're a mixture of restricted progenitors. These populations are CKIT positive, but in fact, they don't seem so dependent on CKIT in vivo because when we delete in endothelial cells and leptin receptor positive cells, we don't see a significant decline in frequency. Doesn't mean that they're completely independent of these factors, but um, uh, th they're certainly not as dependent as stem cells and multipotent progenitors. So we wondered what's happening then downstream. When we deplete stem cells, we don't necessarily see a depletion of downstream progenitors, i.e., the frequencies of HPC1 and HP2 cells is, is completely normal in these mice. But if we look downstream of those, um, in 
common lymphoid progenitors, common myeloid progenitors, myeloid erythroid progenitors, granulocyte macrophage progenitors. In every case, there's no effect of deleting SCF from endothelial cells, but we do see a significant reduction from deleting in leptin receptor positive cells. And then when we delete in both cell types, there's no further depletion beyond what we saw from leptin receptor positive cells. You see the same thing with CMPs, see the same thing with MEPs, see the same thing with GMPs. So these restricted progenitor populations do depend on stem cell factor produced by the leptin receptor positive cells, but for some reason, and we don't understand why this is, they don't care about stem cell factor that's made by endothelial cells. So there's some specialization in the niche where you could imagine that there's some difference in the way that the stem cell factor is being presented by endothelial cells versus um, leptin receptor positive cells so that the stem cells are dependent on, on the stem cell factor from both cell types, um, but the restricted progenitors only depend on it from the leptin receptor positive cells. Now, it's been known for, for I don't know, 40, 50 years that stem cell factor is necessary for erythropoiesis. Um, and so this is the uh, lineage of cells that are involved in erythropoiesis. In no case is there any effect of deleting in endothelial cells, but when we delete from leptin receptor positive cells, most of the progenitors in the erythroid lineage goes down, causing the mice to have macrocytic anemia. And as a consequence of that, um, the cells try to compensate and their reticulocyte counts go up. So these are the primary data, but it's the same, um, you see the same kind of trend that I showed you on the last slide, where we get a depletion with the leptin receptor positive cells, um, uh, but not from endothelial cells, and we see a decline in red blood cell counts. Um, so this all raises the question of whether or not, uh, there's been a tendency to assume that every one of these progenitors would have a specialized niche and it would be located someplace different and it would depend on different cell types. And these data suggest that all these CKIT positive restricted, not all of them, most of them, are depending on the same leptin receptor positive cells as the hematopoietic stem cells. The vast majority of hematopoietic stem cells uh, reside around sinusoidal blood vessels. So we wondered if we could begin to image the restricted progenitors and see if they were also around sinusoidal blood vessels. We've only been able to do that so far uh, for um, a subset of early erythroid progenitors that we can, so pre-CFUE and CFUE cells can be marked by CKID and CD105. And when we image those cells, like the stem cells, we see them immediately adjacent to sinusoidal blood vessels. So this is the lumen of a sinusoid, these are leptin receptor positive cells, and this is the erythroid progenitor. And when we look by deep imaging at a lot of different samples, um, we're almost never able to find one of these erythroid progenitors that's not immediately adjacent to a leptin receptor positive cell. Um, they're very close to sinusoidal blood vessels, probably on the order of 80% of these cells are within 5 microns of a sinusoid. Whereas when we look for our, at arterioles, um, they're distant from arterioles. So we do think that these uh, restricted progenitors are mixed in among stem cells in these uh, perisinusoidal niches throughout the bone marrow where they're deriving factors in the stem cells case from both endothelial cells and leptin receptor positive cells, and in the case of uh, these restricted progenitors um, from the leptin receptor positive cells. Um, so what about skeletal stem cells in the bone marrow? Uh, there have been a series of papers um, starting with uh, Paolo Bianco's laboratory suggesting that skeletal stem cells are somehow involved in, uh, in the niche for hematopoietic stem cells. Um, but it was hard to evaluate because, and when I say skeletal stem cell, I'm talking about the cells that you can grow out in culture to form mesenchymal stem cell cultures. So you can take bone marrow cells, grow them adherently, and they'll form fibroblast colonies. And if you passage the fibroblast colonies, they'll give rise to multipotent, um, what people have often called mesenchymal stem cells that can form bone, fat, and cartilage. But the identity of those cells uh, had been unclear because uh, the vast, for many years, the vast majority of the studies were just done by plating out bone marrow cells and then passaging the fibroblast colonies. And so it wasn't clear what cells in vivo gave rise to them and what the real physiological function would be. 
So having started to characterize these perivascular cells in the bone marrow, we looked at the leptin receptor positive cells in particular, and in fact they do include the skeletal stem cells that are the main source of bone in adult bone marrow. So we can take single leptin receptor positive cells, put them in culture, and they'll undergo multilineage differentiation to form bone and fat and cartilage. Um, and this leptin receptor marker was the first marker that was identified that made it possible to both highly enrich these cells by flow cytometry and to fate map them so that we could study their real physiological function in vivo. I should say that um, Chuck Chan and Mike Longacre have also published some important papers identifying sets of markers by flow cytometry that make it possible to highly enrich um, uh, skeletal stem cells and other mesenchymal progenitors from the bone marrow. And um, to the extent that we can tell, uh, we think that the populations that they've characterized fall within this leptin receptor positive cell population. So um, when we fate map the leptin receptor positive cells, uh, here we're, we're, the red cells derive from the leptin receptor positive cells and the green cells are osteoblasts. The interesting thing with this cell population is that we don't see we see very little contribution to the skeleton in two-month-old mice, but by 10 months, most osteoblasts derive from these leptin receptor positive cells. So if you quantify the effect, um, this is what you see. By 14 months of age, 80% of osteoblasts have derived from these leptin receptor positive cells. So this makes the important point that the leptin receptor positive cells are not forming the skeleton during development. They're maintaining the skeleton during adulthood. So there are different cells. Uh, that are forming the skeleton during development. And other laboratories have also published fate mapping data that's consistent with the same conclusion. If you fracture the adult bone, not all the cells, but many, perhaps most of the cells that contribute to fracture repair derive from these leptin receptor positive cells. These cells also give rise to the fat that accumulates um, throughout adult life in the bone marrow. Uh, um, they have the capacity to form cartilage, but cartilage forms mainly during development. These cells are not contributing to the skeleton during development, and so under normal circumstances, they're not fated to give rise to cartilage. But after a fracture, you form a soft cartilage around the, the fracture site, and many of the cells um, that contribute to fracture healing, uh, uh, that contribute to the formation of that cartilage come from the leptin receptor positive cells. So our, our motivation in kind of characterizing these cell types and understanding the environment was to look at whether there are any um, growth factors in the bone marrow that uh, haven't been, that, that hadn't been discovered previously. So we did um, RNA-seq analysis in the leptin receptor positive cells and looked for transcripts that were predicted to encode secreted proteins that were preferentially expressed in the leptin receptor positive cells and whose um, that looked like they could encode a growth factor, so that is they didn't look like extracellular matrix, and, um, and whose function had never been studied in vivo. And there's a bunch of things like that, uh, one of which turned out to be a new osteogenic growth factor that we propose to call osteolectin. So um, it's part of the C-type lectin domain superfamily. It's a secreted, sulfated glycoprotein. These... Uh, C-type lectin domain family members were numbered systematically, you know, CLEC 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera. Um, it's a huge family, and um, the, the name CLEC doesn't tell you anything about the biology of the family. All it tells you is that there's a, a lectin domain in the protein. So others had noticed that uh, CLEC 11A was expressed in the bone marrow, and so it was assumed to be a hematopoietic growth factor, although, as I said, nobody had studied uh, its function in vivo. When we looked more carefully at it, we found that it was made by a subset of the leptin receptor positive cells, as well as by most osteoblasts, osteocytes, and hypertrophic chondrocytes. We knocked it out. We were initially hoping that it would be a new hematopoietic growth factor, but we looked really hard and we could find no hematopoietic phenotype in these mice. The mice are born in normal numbers. Um, they're normal in size. The hematopoietic system is completely normal. However, when we looked at the bones, there is a bone phenotype. Uh, osteolectin is required to maintain the adult skeleton. Uh, and I'll show you the data now. And, and in view of the fact that this is a bone-forming growth factor, we thought it would be useful to have a name 
uh, that was connected to the biology, and so we've proposed to call this osteolectin. So this is the phenotype that you see. Um, in the osteolectin deficient mice, the skeleton forms normally during development, uh, but it, it bone mass is lost at an accelerated rate during aging. So here you can see we're looking in two-month-old, 10-month-old, 16-month-old mice, a trabecular bone in the long bones and in vertebrae. There's a mild phenotype at two months of age, but by 10 months of age, half the trabecular bone is gone, and by 16 months of age, most of it is gone. You see the same thing in the vertebrae, although the magnitude of the phenotype is milder. Um, the reason why osteolectin is required to maintain the adult skeleton is that it's required to promote the formation of new bone. So in the absence of osteolectin, the rate at which new bone forms is uh, reduced. We don't see any effect on bone resorption, however. So <clears throat> if we take leptin receptor positive cells and we put them in culture and we add osteolectin to culture, um, it promotes bone formation by those cells in culture. And if we inject a mouse daily with recombinant osteolectin, it systemically promotes bone formation. So osteolectin is maintaining the adult skeleton by promoting the differentiation of leptin receptor positive cells into new bone. Mice, like humans, develop osteoporosis if you remove their ovaries. And so this is what it looks like uh, two months after ophorectomy, where you can see relative to the control, there's a lot less trabecular bone. Um, the one FDA-approved uh, anabolic agent that's given to people with osteoporosis to promote the formation of new bone so far is parathyroid hormone. And so if we inject these mice daily with parathyroid hormone, we can rescue this loss of trabecular bone. And similarly, we can also do that with osteolectin. And if you look at the magnitude of the effects, at least to a first approximation, osteolectin looks like it does about as good a job as parathyroid hormone. So of course, we're interested in whether or not this could be uh, a therapeutic that promotes bone formation. But in order to really think about that question, we need to know a lot more about the biology and both the um, part of the excitement but part of the challenge when you discover a new growth factor is that nothing is known. Um, there's no, you don't know what the receptor is. You don't know what the signaling mechanism is. So we've been working on that more recently in my lab. Uh, postdoc in my lab, Bo Shen, as he was thinking about what could the receptor be, he was looking at the structure of human osteolectin and he noticed that there are one or two integrin binding domains that are present in the osteolectin structure. And when he looked evolutionarily, there's two cool things actually. Um, osteolectin doesn't show up until bone shows up. So it appears in zebrafish and it's evolutionarily conserved after zebrafish, but in species that don't have bones, we don't think they have osteolectin either. And in all the species that have osteolectin, they always have at least one integrin binding domain in the protein, uh, either this RGD domain or this LDT domain. So he hypothesized that there might be an integrin receptor. And so we looked at the expression patterns of all of the integrins, looking at, um, we thought, well, if there's a receptor that's really responsible for the osteogenic effect of osteolectin, it should be preferentially expressed in osteogenic cells. And we asked whether there are any integrins that are highly restricted in their expression to osteogenic cells. And so this is looking across all of the cell populations in the bone marrow. Osteolectin itself is made in leptin receptor positive cells and in osteoblasts. Um, and there's one integrin that also shows a similar expression pattern, actually one or two. I'll, I'll get into um, a nuance in a minute. But integrin alpha 11 is also highly expressed by leptin receptor positive cells and osteoblasts, not by other cell types. And alpha 11 is a relatively understudied integrin because it's so highly restricted in its expression. It's not like alpha 4 and alpha 5 um, that are widely expressed. So Bo tested whether or not osteolectin could bind uh, to alpha 11 or a number of other integrins. And it binds with nanomolar affinity both to alpha 11 beta 1 integrins, so integrins heterodimerize, or to alpha 10 beta 1. Alpha 10 is similarly restricted in its expression, although it's not so much in the leptin receptor positive cells, but it is in hypertrophic chondrocytes. 
another cell type that undergoes um, osteogenic differentiation. And so it could be that alpha-11 is the important receptor in leptin receptor positive cells and maybe osteoblasts, and alpha-10 might be the receptor in hypertrophic chondrocytes. So we, we, we then actually, when Bo first saw this, I, I told him I was skeptical, that I wouldn't believe it until he knocked it out and showed he could knock it out and phenocopy the osteolectin knockout phenotype. And so we looked into the literature, and there was uh, a prior paper that knocked out alpha-11 in the germline. And um, these mice uh, have a defect in tooth formation that causes the mice to become malnourished. And these mice are smaller. So they're smaller, they have smaller bones. But the interpretation of the paper was that the smaller bones was just a consequence of the malnutrition of the tooth phenotype, not that alpha-11 itself was required for bone formation. And so we realized that the key experiment is to conditionally delete alpha-11 from the leptin receptor positive cells and ask, then do we see a defect in osteogenesis? So we made the flox allele and we did the experiment. If we grow out stromal cells in culture, um, Osteolectin, as I've already told you, promotes bone formation by those cells. But the, uh, the alpha-11 deficient bone marrow stromal cells make less bone in culture, and they no longer respond to osteolectin. You no longer see the osteogenic response of bone marrow stromal cells to osteolectin. So that was a pretty good sign that they need alpha-11 um, uh, as an osteolectin receptor. So um, the, looking in vivo, when we conditionally delete alpha-11, um, we see no phenotype at two months of age, consistent with the fact that the osteolectin knockout phenotype is very mild at two months of age. But by six months of age, you can see this um, loss of trabecular bone in both male and female mice. So um, the, the conditional deletion of alpha-11 uh, from the leptin receptor positive cells uh, does a pretty good job of phenocopying the osteolectin deficiency phenotype. So what pathway uh, is, is alpha-11 signaling through? Well, the clearest effect that we saw when we put, out, when we put osteolectin on uh, bone marrow stromal cells in culture is we see an activation of the Wnt pathway. We see phosphorylation of GSK3, and we see an increase in the amount of beta-catenin. And then when we look at Wnt pathway target genes, we see an increase in a significant increase in their expression. So we think that osteolectin is binding to alpha 11 beta 1, promoting signaling through uh, the Wnt pathway. If we conditional, if we delete alpha 11 from bone marrow stromal cells, now we see less GSK3 phosphorylation, and these cells no longer respond to osteolectin, either with GSK3 phosphorylation or with beta-catenin activation. We also don't see the transcription of Wnt pathway target genes. So I'd sum up by saying that um, we've identified a new ligand receptor interaction that's important physiologically for maintaining the adult skeleton. Um, the leptin receptor positive cells are the main source of colony forming units fibroblast in the bone marrow, um, as well as giving rise to osteoblasts in the adult bone marrow. These cells are not important during development, they're just important for the maintenance of the adult skeleton. Osteolectin is made by those cells as well as by osteoblasts and other um, bone cells, and it promotes the differentiation of leptin receptor positive cells into osteoblasts by binding to alpha-11 beta-1 integrin and by activating uh, the Wnt pathway. So there were a lot of people in my lab that were involved in these studies. Um, the original studies uh, making the SCF-GFP, CXCL12, DS-RED mice, um, uh, and all of the conditional deletion studies were done by Lei Ding. He literally characterized about 50 genetic backgrounds per paper that he characterized. Uh, he's got his own laboratory now at Columbia University where he's continuing to do really important work on the niche. It was um, Stefano Comazetto, uh, currently in my lab, who looked at the restricted progenitors and showed that they also require their uh, leptin receptor positive cells as part of their niche. Um, Bo Zhou uh, originally discovered that the leptin receptor positive cells also include skeletal stem cells in adult bone marrow. He's got his own laboratory at the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Shanghai. Ray Yu discovered osteolectin. 
Uh, he's got his own laboratory at Tongji University, and also uh, in Shanghai. And uh, Bo Shen is the one who discovered that uh, the receptor for osteolectin, or at least a, an important receptor for osteolectin, is alpha-11 integrin. So thank you. Sorry, if you compare the leptin receptor positive cells to what? I don't know, um, Mike. Are you, the so I think one Chuck, are you here, Mike? The question is, how much overlap is there between the leptin receptor positive cell population and the cell populations that you guys identified? So in, in human, it would be different. Um, so I can't answer that question. But in mouse, I, I'm not exactly sure. I. I I know we have that data, and I can get it to you. I just don't have the answer off the top of my head. In terms of uh, a Venn diagram of, of those cells and the skeletal stem cell that we reported, I, I can't answer off the top of my yeah. head. Yeah. So we looked at it in, in adult mice, and um, the populations that Chuck identified fall within the leptin receptor positive population. I don't know if it's 100% or if it's 80%, but substantially fall within that population in the adult bone marrow. The thing that's a little bit complicated about this is that most of Chuck's experiments were done in developing bones. And the leptin receptor positive population is not, those, the leptin receptor positive cells don't exist during development. Um, but the last I heard from Chuck, he felt that those same populations, the same markers were still informative in adulthood. And so during adulthood, they do overlap with the leptin receptor positive population. Hello, I have a question over here. Um, so I'm intrigued by the importance of these lep R cells. What do you think is the role of leptin in these processes and the implications of obesity um, in stem cells? Yeah, um, these cells are regulated by leptin. The, the cells don't require leptin for their maintenance, but it regulates <coughs> their differentiation. Leptin promotes their differentiation into fat at the expense of bone. And we think this explains the longstanding observation that uh, obese people, if you take, if you correct for body mass, their bones are a little thinner than what you would expect. Um, so if you feed mice a high fat diet, you have a lot of adipogenesis in the bone marrow. But if you delete leptin receptor from the bone marrow stromal cells, you um, almost completely eliminate that adipogenesis in the bone marrow. Sean, fantastic presentation as always. <clears throat> as you know, our interest, of course, is on leukemia primarily. And with the genetic models that you have, have you been able to explore the niche requirements in any uh, mouse leukemia models? I think there's a lot of controversy about what cells are actually required and what cells are not. You know, we tried to look at that, and um, we weren't able to find a leukemia model that showed any niche dependence. As far as in all the, the models that we looked at, the cells would just come in and destroy everything and overrun the bone marrow, and they didn't care whether stem cell factor was present in leptin receptor positive cells or endothelial cells or CXCL12 for that matter. So leukemia cells are so much more factor independent. Now, that's not to say that there's not certain leukemia models that may, may be dependent on certain cell types. Uh, uh, we gave our mice to uh, Giannis Ifontis' laboratory, and they showed that when they deleted CXCL12 from endothelial cells, that they could no longer get engraftment of the TALL cells in the bone marrow. But when we did that same experiment with a different TALL model, we didn't see that effect. And so I think... In general, certainly aggressive leukemias are not going to show the kind of niche dependence that the normal cells do, but there may be certain earlier stage cancers or certain examples of more aggressive ones where there may be some effect. Great. Great talk, Sean. Yeah. Uh, two quick questions, maybe, you know, cancer question. Are these L, uh, LEP or positive cells, a cell of origin for tumors like sarcoma or things like that? And maybe the second question is, the niche that these cells form is really interesting, but there seems to be there might be some competition between the HSCs and the other progenitors for SCF. So is it just expressed super highly and there would be no competition, or is it really that they might compete under certain conditions for? SCF? So with respect to the first question, 
Um, we don't know whether these cells are the cell of origin for sarcomas. We just don't have any data. But one of the big questions in this area has been the cell of origin for fibrosis, you know, the fibrosis that develops in the bone marrow with myeloproliferative disease. Um, uh, there have been, again, various claims about this, not really directly tested. The leptin receptor positive cells are the source of fibrosis uh, in the bone marrow. Um, Lei Ding uh, has shown that in his own laboratory. Um, with respect to competition for stem cell factor, I agree that you would think that there would be competition for stem cell factor. Although one curious thing is that we think that CKIT signals through the PI3 kinase pathway, and we see very little PI3 kinase pathway activation in hematopoietic stem cells. In fact, genetically, when we've gone in and manipulated the pathway, they have to have very little. They can't tolerate increased activation of the pathway. So we think that they're the amount of stimulation that they get from stem cell factor is very limited. Um, and I don't know if that's also true for restrictor progenitors. Uh, Anishka Chekowitz has really interesting data from way back in Irv's laboratory showing that the stem cells are much more sensitive to deprivation of stem cell factor as compared to the restrictor progenitors when you use her blocking antibody to do that. And so these different cell types, I think there's a lot of biology there that's, that's regulating their access to stem cell factor, and that would kind of affect the way you think about uh, competition. Um, just wanted, oops, I wanted to thank, um, uh, because I wanted to move on, I wanted to thank Sean for coming um, and for giving an incredibly stimulating talk. So thanks very much.